Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Shasya Sharma. I'm a product manager with S3, and I'm joined today by Carl Summers, a senior engineer on the S3 team. Now, in this session, we'll uh, be walking you through S3 Object Lambda. It's the brand new feature that was launched and announced just earlier this morning. We'll keep the session short and simple, and we'll cover three main areas today. We'll first understand what this new Object Lambda feature is all about. Next, we'll work backwards from our customers, understanding why this feature is important and where you might find it useful in your applications. So reviewing some common use cases along the way. Lastly, we'll get tactical and we'll talk about how Object Lambda works and what you will need to get started with it. The talk track will be immediately followed by an in-depth demo that Carl will be leading us through. S3 Object Lambda allows you to add your own code to process data that is retrieved from S3 before returning it to an application. For the first time, you can now use custom code to modify the data returned by standard S3 GET requests. Now, you can use this to filter certain rows out of your objects. You can use it to dynamically resize them, to redact or mask uh, confidential information, or to otherwise modify data that is being returned by S3. All request in data processing runs on AWS Lambda infrastructure, meaning that it is fully managed by AWS. Your custom code executes on demand. It eliminates the need to create and store derivative copies of your data, and it requires no changes to your applications. So that's all good, right? Uh, why should you use Object Lambda? Now with Object Lambda, we integrate the simplicity of an S3 API with the power and flexibility of Lambda to enable a variety of use cases. And we see applications in genomics, in backup and recovery, in financial services, amongst many other verticals. Examples of use cases include object redaction in analytics or non-production environments, resizing images on the fly, so this is a use case we've heard from customers with heavy image workloads. It's the ability to deliver different sizes of the same image depending on the requesting hardware. So whether that's a laptop, mobile, or desktop. Another example is filtering log data. And we've heard this uh, from customers, both external as well as internal to AWS. Now, as you know, logs can get really big, they can get really unwieldy, but developers tend to benefit when receiving only the log entries that are relevant for their troubleshooting at that point in time. So for example, these could be logs that are sandboxed by a time window, or these could be logs that contain certain keywords. Other applications include filtering structured objects to only retrieve the rows and the columns that are relevant for the requesting client or application or even augmenting data into an object that was not a part of it as the object sat in S3. So why is this important? Now, often customers have a single large shared data set with S3 that tends to feed multiple applications where each application requires a slightly differing view of the object in order to meet its specific requirements. So for example, I've got a data set here that was created by an e-commerce application, and it may contain some confidential information that is not really needed when the data is being processed by an analytics application. Whereas uh, the same data may require to be augmented with additional information when it is handled by someone in the marketing department. So for example, information from a customer loyalty database. So we see, depending on who's accessing the object, a different variant of it may be needed. To provide multiple applications with the view of the object that they need, customers can take one of two approaches today. 
Now, option one is to create and manage an infrastructure as a proxy layer in front of S3. And this creates derivatives of the objects on the fly. The other option is to create many different derivative copies of the objects and to store all of them so that each application has its own custom built data set that is tailored specifically for it. Now, neither option is exactly ideal and both can quickly become expensive and difficult to manage. So we wanted to offer customers a better way. And this really is the value proposition of Object Lambda. It's a completely managed solution. There's no infrastructure for you to set up, and there's no extra copies to be, man uh, to be stored. You can now simply author an AWS Lambda function with your own custom code, and this Lambda function will be automatically invoked when an object is requested from S3. So processing that requested object before returning it back to you. Now, in order to get started with Object Lambda, you need to complete four simple steps. First, create an S3 access point. Access points are unique host names that you can create to reach S3 buckets. Typically, they can be used to enforce distinct permissions and network controls for any request that is made through the access point. Access points are also custom built for use in shared data sets. And we'll soon see that this access point is going to play a supporting role in our overall setup. Second, you'll need to author a Lambda function that performs the required processing. Third, you'll need to create a special object Lambda access point that must be configured with the recently created S3 access point and the Lambda function from steps one and two. Lastly, simply use object Lambda access point in your application to start invoking Lambda functions with your GET requests. So I mentioned that the standard S3 access point will, will play a supporting role here. What do I mean when I say that? And why do we really need it? And most importantly, what is the relationship between these three components that we just created? So here's a simple request and data flow diagram to help answer some of these questions. What you see on here on the left-hand side is that applications will make all their requests versus the single object Lambda endpoint. Object Lambda will then evaluate the request. If it sees a GET request, it automatically invokes the configured Lambda function well, because we wanted to perform a compute operation on the requested object. If it is not a GET request, the request will be relayed to our supporting access point, which connects us directly to S3 to execute the request as normal. Now note that regardless of whether you are retrieving or storing data into S3 or performing any other operation, your request will eventually land on the supporting S3 access point. I want to take a moment to talk about how this is different from simply calling Lambda to act on an S3 object. The fundamental difference here is that the Lambda invocation occurs seamlessly, synchronously with the GET request. So your applications don't need to change. Because the invocation is uh, automatic with the GET request, there is no need for additional triggers to fire the Lambda function or to coordinate Lambda's execution with an object's retrieval from S3. Next, your Lambda function automatically receives relevant context, so it knows which object to retrieve and what permissions to use in order to do that. Your Lambda also knows how to route those objects back to requesting clients and applications. A few more notes here. Each S3 GET request will invoke a single Lambda function. Default Lambda quotas will apply, and this feature is supported by all Lambda runtimes. Transformed objects are streamed back to requesting clients. No additional copies are being created or stored in S3. When working with Object Lambda, Lambda runtimes are limited to 60 seconds. In case your Lambda fails for any reason, you will also receive a request response that details the failure. 
Today, Lambda invocations only occur with GET requests, and all other S3 requests are processed normally. We saw this on the previous slide as well. And I do want to call attention uh, to the fact that we have made ready-made Lambda functions available that can serve as guides and jump starts for this feature. Now, speaking of which, your transformation can be as simple or as complex as required by your application. And while you do have the flexibility of inserting your own custom code in here, you can also use built-in AWS Lambda functions. An example of this is uh, a PII redaction function that's provided by AWS Comprehend. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, AWS Comprehend is a natural language processing service by AWS that automatically detects and redacts sensitive information from text objects. Starting today, AWS Comprehend functions for PII detection and redaction are available in Lambda's serverless application repository. And you can simply plug these into your applications with object Lambda to start redacting sensitive information from your SD te text objects when you retrieve them. By using pre-built Lambda functions uh, and AWS's existing services, you can set up solutions that are managed end-to-end. -end. I want to take a small pause here to talk about multi-tenant environments in S3 and how we're slowly expanding on the many ways to access your objects. You can access your data directly to receive an S3 object in its native form, like application one is doing here. Or you can access your objects via an S3 access point, which can help apply granular security and access controls. But you're still going to receive the native object in this way. Now you can access your bucket through an object Lambda access point, which in addition to applying your granular access controls will also format the object as you specify before the object comes back to you. Okay, so I invoked a Lambda function. Now what? What does my Lambda have to work with? Lambda receives many inputs from object Lambda, but I'm going to recap the main ones here. First, object context. Object context contains a pre-signed URL using which functions can fetch the original object from S3, though uh, through the supporting access point. Next, note that the Lambda function sits squarely between the object Lambda access point and the supporting S3 access point. So it needs the arms of both of these resources in order to fetch and return objects, and this is provided through a configuration. Third, a user request property that provides more input about the request itself. So for example, if you were adding any headers, this is where you would go ahead and do it. Lastly, the identity of the original caller is passed to Lambda. This means that Lambda can now assume that identity to fetch objects from S3 without having to perform any further lookups. All right then, my Lambda is invoked and it has all of this rich content. What can it do now? We'll see this with two simple examples. In this one, Lambda receives input that we discussed on our previous slides. Thereon, it uses the pre-signed URL to fetch the original object from S3, followed by transforming the object. Now, in this example, it's a fairly, sim it's a fairly simple transformation in which we are operating on a text object and uh, translating all of the content from lowercase to uppercase. And lastly, using the write get object response API, we can stream the object back to the requester. Now, while Lambda can be used to retrieve an object from S3 to process it, it can just as easily process the request itself. And, and here's an example. 
So we have a customer in S3 that stores a large number of parquet files. They have very particular access requirements. So for example, only give access to employee John Doe uh, when John Doe is in Japan on a Tuesday and never otherwise. Furthermore, they want to ensure that only the relevant rows and columns um, in their parquet files are filtered out based on their own custom authorization rule. Now, following this example, they can use Object Lander to intercept the GET requests and then to evaluate the access privileges of the requesting user or role by making several lookups versus their own proprietary human attribute database. In this case, the customer has it stored in DynamoDB. Then they use the verification result to only return the rows and columns from the object that the requesting user had permissions to access. In this manner, building a custom authorizer for their organization. Now, whether you choose to use Object Lambda to process requests or to process data, you can easily connect Object Lambda with other AWS services like DynamoDB in this example, or AWS Comprehend from a couple of slides back, whatever your application needs. And we really look forward to seeing what you will build with Object Lambda.